everyone, Miss Anna here, and today for To Be Continued Book Club, I'm going to be reading Cinders and Sparrows by Stefan Bachman. Let's get started with chapter one. It was the first day of autumn when I came to Blackbird Castle. The trees copper and green, pumpkins growing along the ditch by the side of the road, a moon like a lidded silver eye already visible in the evening sky. In short, an excellent day for a witch to return to her ancestral home. But of course, I knew nothing of witches then. My mind was on simpler things. The spring that had wormed its way through the velvet of the coach bench and was poking me in the back, the fact that I was cold and stiff, and also the fact that we had just stopped with a jolt in the middle of the road. The coachman thrust his red-cheeked face through the window. That's it, miss, he growled. That's all the farther I'll take you then. I blinked at him. Then I clambered out of the coach, dragging my carpet bag with me. We were on a desolate mountainside, forest to my left, a precipice to my right, a river rumbling somewhere far below. Blackbird Castle, I asked. Where is it? Not far, said the coachman, pointing up the mountain. If you can fly. My gaze followed his wizened finger, my heart sinking. There was a path stitched with bridges winding to and fro among the cliffs and forested slopes, and far, far back, its towers barely poking over the crowns of the great old trees were the spires of a house. A few glowing lights pierced the gloom like watchful eyes. I don't suppose there's any way to get the carriage up there, I asked as politely as I could. I did pay for the full journey. You didn't pay me near enough to take you up right up to the Blackbird's front door, the coachman said and spat onto the road. His great inky horses were pawing and snorting, their breath steaming in the chilly air. Not for all the gold and Westville. What's a girl like you doing up there, going up there anyway? His gaze darkened. You're not one of them, are you? No, I said, but what I meant was, I hope to be very soon. The coachman peered at me more closely, his eyes glinting like a pair of coins under the wide brim of his hat. I trust you know the rumors about their old witch queen, how she ate the hearts of her enemies for dinner, boiled on a bed of greens, how they've all got pairs of silver scissors hanging from their belts and no one knows what's for. And listen to this, Betsy Guilford once told me she crept up to a window and saw them dancing around a circle of chalk on the drawing room floor and all the spiders in the room were dancing with them. I squinted suspiciously at the coachman. That sounds highly unlikely. He snorted, but he looked confused. I suppose he had expected me to be frightened. All I'm telling you, he said, is you better watch yourself. Odd things happen in these hills. Betsy Guilford's cow once wandered up that very path and was found next atop Potts Peak, it's hide written all over with gibberish. I think perhaps you shouldn't believe everything Betsy Guilford tells you, I said, pulling down my hat. But thank you for the warning. I'm sure I'll be all right. I smiled at him. They're expecting me. The coachman guffawed. No doubt they are. He gave me one last sharp look, which I did not like at all. Then with a flick of his reins, he turned the coach on a precarious corner and thundered back down the mountain into the gathering gloom. I had been the last passenger on the stagecoach. I boarded it in the city of Manzamir, squeezing myself in between the door and a mini chinned old lady eating plums. She had been very nice and had shared her plums with me, as well as everything I could possibly want to know about her seven children and 32 grandchildren but she disembarked at Gorlitz and slowly one by one, all the other passengers had gotten out too, at villages and hamlets and farms. I'd watched them embracing old acquaintances, vanishing into houses and through creaking garden gates. It made me excited for my own journeys and I was an orphan and until three days ago had believed I would remain so for the rest of my life. But fate had other plans and let me know one of them in the oddest ways imaginable. I was in Mrs. Bolivar's back garden, balancing on a chair on top of another chair on top of an enormous pink hat box, trying to lift a cat from its precarious position atop the boiler when the scarecrow arrived with a letter. Just a moment, I called above the shrilling doorbell. 
The cat hissed and batted at me with its claws. It was an odd looking thing, rather shadowy, its teeth a bit too long. In a stern voice, I said to it, look, you're going to be stuck up there forever if you don't let me help you. The cat gave me a supercilious stare. Isn't it a bit hot up there? Aren't you burning? Now the cat looked as if it were grinning at me. The bell rang again. I said, just a moment, I shouted. And from inside, Mrs. Bolivar shouted too, her ancient voice only slightly less shrill than the bell. Who is making that infernal racket? Go answer the door, girl. I was employed as a maid by Mrs. Bolivar, who was a widow and lived in Cricktown, far out in the middle of nowhere. Mrs. Bolivar was 97 and walked with a cane. As for me, I was 12, tall and underfed, with wild black hair, the sort of hair you might call curly if you were charitable, or if you were Mrs. Bolivar, a hopeless briar patch so bewitched by the fairies that combs and hairpins become irretrievably lost in it. What an extraordinary looking girl, she had said when I'd first arrived from the orphanage, and I don't think she meant it as a compliment. I must have taken too long to answer the bell because in the end, the scarecrow clambered right over the garden wall to reach me. I had just landed with a squelch in the grass when I was confronted with the pair of legs clad in ragged paisley trousers. My gaze traveled upward until I was looking into eyes made from large silver buttons. Oh, I thought, flinching a little. The scarecrow was very old, practically falling to pieces. Mushrooms grew from its face and its coattails were rotting and mossy, but the envelope it held was not old. It was thick papered and creamy, stamped with a novel of black wax in the shape of a raven. The scarecrow said nothing to me. It only bowed very low, handed me the letter and then clambered back over the wall, its wooden bones creaking. I saw the top of its stovepipe hat, hat skimming away as it sauntered down the alley. I stood for a moment looking at the letter. For Zeta Bridgeborn, it said in large coiling script, and that made me flinch all over again, for I had not seen that name nor heard it spoken in 10 long years. Who was that? Mrs. Bol Bolivar asked, hobbling up next to me. A scarecrow, I said, and Mrs. Bolivar nodded grimly. She did not hear very well and she didn't like to admit it. And what have you got there? A letter. For me? No, I said, not quite believing it myself. I think, I think it's for me. Mrs. Bolivar squinted at the envelope through her little spectacles. Zita who? She demanded, giving me a resentful once over, as if seeing me for the first time as a human girl and not a walking broom. And then I could not wait a second longer. I ran up to my attic, my heart squirming in my chest, and for a good minute, I simply sat on the floor, cradling the letter in my hands. It was like a beacon, this letter, or a life ring tossed into a stormy sea. I was no longer adrift in the world. Someone, somewhere, knew that I existed. Fingers trembling, I broke the seal. Dear Miss Zita Bridgeborn, the letter began, and again, my heart gave a strange little lurch. That name was secret. Everyone knew me as Ingabeth because that was the name the great wimpled nun had given me upon my arrival at the orphanage. I had been two and according to orphanage lore had been left on the doorstep precisely at sunset, my hair full of twigs and the rest of me entirely covered in soot. Think you're the queen of everything, do you? The nun had said while I had sat on a chair in the front hall. Zita indeed, what a frivolous name for a little girl no one wanted. And so I tucked the name away, a little treasure all for myself. No one should have known it. And yet, someone did. Dear Zeta Bridgeborn, I write to you as the solicitor of the Bridgeborn estate. I have reason to believe you are the sole heir to Blackbird Castle and its environs, as well as any monies, accounts, lands, and property within. I bid you come at your earliest convenience to Blackbird Castle, north of Hackenden Village, in the Westfall, where, if it can be proven you are the heir, we will complete the paperwork post-haste. Your humble servant, Charles Grinwe, Dun Dubney and Sons Esquire. Of course, I hadn't believed the letter right away. I had walked to the post office and asked about the address. From the Bridgeborns of Westfall, the clerk had said, looking down at me incredulously from behind his desk. 
Very great family, very important. Why ever would the Bridgeborn send a letter to you? I had told him I had no idea. I still had no idea, but I was not about to let such an invitation go unanswered. And so 12 hours later, I left Mrs. Bolivar and set off on the steam train to Hackenden, my wages inside my coat pocket and a new hat on my head. It had been a much longer journey than I had expected. Steam train turned to donkey cart, which turned back to steam train until at last, three days later, I had boarded the post coach in Manzamere. I had been ready to burst from the, my skin the entire way, the excitement dulling every jolt and rattle. It was a lovely thing, feeling that perhaps I had my own door and welcoming embraces waiting, that perhaps I was going home. And that's where we're going to stop on Cinders and Sparrows by Stefan Bachman. Look at that awesome cover. If you like chapter one and you want to find out what happens to Zita Bridgeborn or Ingebet, you can check this book out um, at any one of our branches. Thanks for joining us for another To Be Continued Book Club, and we will see you next time. Bye!